All right. Uh, now, I had prepared, <clears throat> I got two things here on my plate. All right. I, I don't know if we can do them both or not. Um, we're on warning number five, which is do not repeat. That's the last warning in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter number 12. And then last week, Gail asked me, uh, I, I made the mention of uh, uh, the Jews perceived that there was four other Messiah type individuals in their in their history. And Gail asked me about that, if you remember last week. And I, if, if you want me to run through it real quickly, I can do that. We might be able to do both here at the same time. Um, now, the information for these four other types of uh, messiahs come from a book called Simply Jesus by N.T. Wright. Uh, now, I see Dan hooked up with us. Yeah, uh, Dan's iPhone. Now, he, he's read this. I'm on the last chapter. <laughs> uh, Dennis has read it. My brother Tim, I gave it to him at the family reunion, and, and he went through it in, th in three sittings. And he says it's amazing. He's never read anything like this. And what it is, it's the it's a view of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he actually came to accomplish here on earth. Okay? Because we see, you know, we see Jesus as as the Savior, which he is, primarily the Savior. But how did it all come about? And I've never read that except to read the gospel account, you know, the prophecies, the gospel account, and that. But Mr. Wright uh, shows you that there was a pattern in the life of Israel, all right, and the redemption that took place. Because, you know, we know Jesus is the ultimate Savior, but we find uh, somebody like Moses. Here's Israel was in captivity, right, in Egypt uh, uh, under a power, a world power. And God sends a Messiah to them, all right? And through that Messiah, God works, and Israel is what? They're, they escape, okay? They're, they're redeemed from what's going on. I see the same thing with David, uh, King David, and with the uh, uh, Philistines, all right? And other smaller nations around, uh, around Israel. And the same pattern takes place there, okay? Now, as you move down the, the uh, uh, timeline, all right, and get closer to our Lord Jesus Christ, what you find that there's uh, two gentlemen prior to the Lord Jesus Christ and two gentlemen um, after the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, one is in the time frame of 66 to 70 AD. Another one's in about one... 130 AD, but the other two were uh, before the Lord shows up, and uh, it's it's really interesting to see this. So if if you'd like me to go through that with you quickly or not quickly, I'd have to read most of it. Uh, wh what do you think? You let me know, okay? Just unmute yourself and say yes or no. Of um, yes. <laughs> there's there's a yes. By, by yes. Okay, Christy Christy says yes. So. Uh, yes. Let me, let me let Richard in. I think that's Richard there. Okay. And so that that's where we are. So, well, let me do this, and if uh, we have time, we'll we'll just do both lessons here. All right. Uh, Joy says yes. Also. So what we find is this, and and I, I, I'm going to have to read uh, out of his book uh, uh, quite a bit, but. He begins this chapter, the kingdom, present and future, uh, Mr. Wright does. And he says, when Jesus healed people, when he celebrated parties with all and sundry, when he offered forgiveness freely to people as if he were replacing the temple itself with his own work. In all these ways, it was clear that he intended it to be, uh, that he intended it and uh, that this wasn't just a foretaste of future reality. In other words, when he came, the reality of God's kingdom came with him. All right. If, if I just say it that way, it, it, it's simple. All right. As, as you see this. So uh, he says this. In order to answer this, we must come forward 
from our earlier glance at the stories of ancient Israel and look very briefly at four men. Now, let me do say this. What Mr. Wright does is he uses the allegory of the perfect storm. I think if you've all seen that movie uh, with George Clooney and others in it, that, that was a good movie. But that was a true event that happened, all right? And he equates that to what was going on when the Lord shows up. You, you had a, a Roman Empire, and I can't remember exactly the terminology here, but it's like a hurricane coming through, see? Then you had the, uh, uh, the Jewish religion as a strong wind that's hitting the area. And then, of course, you have the Lord Jesus Christ coming, all right? So you had these three powerful uh, of events, if you want to call them that, that are coming together, all right? And what happens, they're producing something, a perfect storm. And so he, what he does is equates that to the time frame of our Lord Jesus Christ actually coming to this earth. And uh, he uses the first four or five chapters to explain each one of them in detail, you see. And so it's, it's kind of interesting as, as you see that. And it gives you another idea or view of it's just not black and white in the gospel accounts that we're seeing, but he brings the history into it. Uh, and, and that sort of things, okay, as, as you see this. So what he does is he says this, the stories of ancient Israel and look very briefly at four men, two before Jesus and two after, whose careers embody something of the same present and future tense that will clear the way to fresh understanding of what Jesus was really all about. So, so it's interesting. So the first gentleman, uh, the heading says Judah the Hammer, all right? <laughs> Judah the Hammer. And his name was Judas Maccabeus, all right? Judas Maccabeus. And uh, that's his actual name, but he became known as Judas, or Judah, rather, the, the Hammer. And it says he came to prominence during the crisis of 160 BC, 160 years prior to Christ, okay? almost exactly 200 years before the public ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. And it says, like Jesus, the crucial part of his career was a three-year campaign, ending in triumphal entry into Jerusalem and a cleansing of the temple. Now, it's interesting, all right? A three-year career with a, uh, a campaign in which he ended it with a triumphal entry into Jerusalem and a cleansing of the temple. Uh, but there the parallel stops, he says. So in 167 and 66 BC, this revolution, he starts, all right? And I'll show you what the revolution was about here in a second. And in 164, he cleanses the temple. Now remember our Lord. He starts his kingdom movement when he came to earth and began his earthly ministry at his baptism, all right? And then, of course, in, in 30 AD, he cleanses the temple, if you remember that. So here's a little background then on Judah. In Judah's day, it was Syria, immediately to the north, that had taken over Jerusalem. The Syrian king, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, Antiochus means divine appearance. So this is the name he took, okay? And what he did was desecrated the temple, rededicating it to pagan, the pagan god Zeus. Now the temple we're speaking about is a temple that uh, Zacharias uh, rebuilt. If you remember, coming back from uh, the Babylonian captivity. You know, if you read Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, you get it, it, the picture in there, okay? So what happened is Antiochus Epiphanes came down and rededicated, rededicated the temple to the pagan god Zeus and was trying to smash the resistance, uh, the resistance spirit of the Jews by forcing them to break their holy laws by eating pork. 
you know, to the Jews, that was anathema. The resistance was led by one family whose figurehead Judah the Hammer waged a three-year guerrilla campaign, at the end of which he cleansed the temple of pagan elements. Now, this is going to happen again in 70 AD, or between 66 and 70 AD. This is the event still commemorated annually in the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, or Hanukkah. You've all heard of that, right? The Jewish uh, festival of Hanukkah. And that's what it's a celebration of, is of, of Judah the hammer cleansing, you know, the temple. Uh, uh, and through his work, the Jews revolted against Syria and, and kicked them out, okay? So Judah's family celebrated their success by parading about, singing hymns, and significantly, for our story, carrying palm branches. So when he cleansed the temple, they had a big party, and everybody was carrying palm branches. Now, you remember when the Lord came into Jerusalem? All right, uh, we call it the Holy Week prior to his uh, uh, crucifixion. They laid down palm branches. Well, where'd they get the idea from? See, it comes from the Old Testament prophets, and that's what Judah the Hammer and the people at that time thought was happening, okay? So just a little more on Judah. Judah's victory, consolidated later by his brothers, was enough to establish his family in the role of high priest, and the king of Judah of the Jews, even though they didn't come from the right families to hold either of these offices. Equally important, they sharpened up the ancient storyline. Here's the storyline. The wicked tyrant oppressing God's people, the noble and heroic leader risking all, fighting the key battle, cleansing the temple, and setting Israel free to follow God and his law once more. This was the story of Moses, Egypt, and the Exodus. It was the story of David, Solomon, the Philistines, and the temple. It was the story of Babylon overthrown of return from exile. So it's all very interesting. Then he makes a, a note and he says the book picks up this most explicitly in Daniel, in the book of Daniel. Remember Daniel and his friends in their battle against the Babylonians, you see? Uh, it, it's interesting, and, and what happened, what the Jews have always tried to do is take that 490 year period and, and apply it to what they see the, the Messiah is, all right? Now, y'all know that, you know, the seven times 70, 490 year period, and if, if you take it from Daniel, to 70 AD, it's a perfect 470 years. But what happened is John Darby, who is the father, the basic father of and, and writer of premillennialism, he puts a parentheses there and breaks up the uh, these 490 years. Okay, so we see that. So what <laughs> what ultimately happened with uh, Judah the Hammer? is that he was uh, replaced and removed by the Pharisees because he and his family weren't of the right family to be the priests or the kings. And so the Pharisees revolted against that and he was replaced, okay? Now, uh, there's another little note here concerning him and the Jewish thought, and that's this. But the point is that the great story had been etched into their minds. What story? The story of Moses, Egypt, redemption, David, Solomon, okay, Philistines, that sort of thing. And it says here, but the point is that the great story had been etched into their minds and into their scripture reading habits. The wicked rulers, the people's sufferings, the hero, the battle, the victory, the rule over surrounding nations, the establishment of God's dwelling. This was what people were praying for, hoping for, waiting for when Jesus of Nazareth came on the scene. And of course, Jesus didn't follow that pattern as, as, as we look at it. But this thing about scripture reading habits being etched, and, and I can see that in, in reading church history and in my own life. You get so 
ingrained in one thought that you don't allow yourself to go anywhere else, see? And that's what happened to the Jews. Now, the second person, now we're going to go to the future here. The second person's name, he's called Simon the Star, S-T-A-R, all right? And actually, his, his name is Simon Son. Uh, where, where is his? Let me come down here to where his real name is. Uh, Simon, son of Bar Kochba, Kochba, K O C H B A. All right. Now he shows up around 132 A.D. Okay. So this is after the Lord has, has come, and what he tried to do is he he it was an unsuccessful Jewish revolt against Rome in Egypt, Cyrene, and Cyprus, all right? And it's, it's important here because the Jews led these. Remember, a lot of the Jews uh, didn't go to Babylon. They went down to Egypt, and they hid out down in Egypt, all right? And a lot of them didn't, never did come back to Jerusalem. But in 132, they started filtering back, all right? Hoping to bring the kingdom back, the Jewish kingdom back. But what we find is, is this, in 117 uh, AD now, Hadrian became the emperor of Rome. And in 132, Hadrian instituted anti-Jewish leg legislation. He builds a temple, and this is something I never knew, and I had to look it up in other places, but he builds a temple of Jupiter in Jerusalem. Now, this is in 132 AD well after the Lord has come and gone, okay? Now, 133, the star of Bar Kochba, Kochba, I guess is how you say his name, and it's called a rebellion, the, the start of the Bar Kochba rebellion, okay? Rabbi Akaba hails Bar Kochba as the Messiah. So what we find is this, there's a rebellion taking place against King Hadrian of Rome, okay? Now, this is something that's kind of neat. In 133, it's a three-year rebellion. In 133, the Jews issue coins with year one on it. Remember, they, they never put a person's face on it, okay? That's why when the Lord said, you know, someone asked the Lord, should we pay taxes? And, and he says, uh, well, whose face is on the coin? Well, of course, it was Caesar, right? And so he said, pay your taxes. Well, the Jews couldn't do that. So they, they had a coin that said year one. That was year one of their rebellion. Then in 134, they have uh, year two. So more coins with year two of their rebellion. And then in 135, they had a third coin they put out in year three of their rebellion. Okay. Now, in that same year, Rome crushes the rebellion, okay? And uh, Bar Simon, I'll just say, and Aqaba, the uh, uh, rabbi, are killed, okay? But again, what the story is about is this, a wicked king, Rome, another time of intense suffering, and another new hero emerges, winning, it seems, some initial uh, victories. Another three-year campaign, just as the Lord, three years, all right, uh, does that, defeats the pagan enemy, it reestablishes the temple. Of course, the temple was what temple? It was a temple of uh, Juniper, but it didn't last very long. Liberates the Judeans and establishes a new king as a master in his own realm, and perhaps more widely, okay? But he's quickly put down in three years by the Romans. So there you have two of them. Now, the third one is, is almost hard for me to believe, but the Jews believed it, and that's Herod the Great. Y'all know who he was, Herod the Great? He was the one that had all the children that were two years and younger killed, you know, when they uh, heard about it through the, through the wise men, okay? But uh, what we have here is uh, Mr. Wright, saying this, and now I'll just give you a little chronology of, of Herod. He said, Herod the Great fulfilled at least some of the story we have been tracking. 
He began his career as a successful warlord a century or so after the time of Judah the Hammer. There was one once uh, again a power vacuum in the Middle East. The uh, Hasmonean royal house was in disarray. Now the Hasmoneans were Jewish people. And remember this, I don't know if you know this about the Jews or about the Romans. What they chose to do instead of sending their own people to rule, they chose people within the country of the own, uh, you know, like the Jewish, uh, Israel, Jewish people to rule in the name of Rome there, okay, is, is what we see there. So that uh, Hasmonean who were chosen, the royal house there was in disarray. The Romans were gaining power and their famous general Pompey captured Jerusalem in 63, 63 BC. As we saw earlier, the Romans preferred when possible to rule their subject nations through local elites. So they allowed the Hasmonean family to carry on as high priests, okay? But the Roman world was about to be plunged into chaos. Pompey was killed in 48 BC. Judas uh, Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC, bringing on a civil war from which, as we saw, Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, would emerge as the first actual Roman Empire. Meanwhile, Rome's old enemy, Parthia, correspond roughly to modern Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, seized the moment to invade Roman possessions in the Middle East, including Jerusalem. All right, including Jerusalem. So uh, a lot a lot goes on back in those days, okay? Goes on. So here's what happened. Rome comes in and quelches the rebellion. They make Herod the Great, okay, who is a most efficient military leader of the moment, uh, already recognized in Rome as the king of the Jews, all right, in Rome as the king of the Jews, on a purely pragmatic grounds, uh, they defeated the Parthians and recaptured Jerusalem on behalf of Rome. He knew which side of the bread his butter was on. In other words, Herod did, okay? So what we find in 44 BC, the death of Julius Caesar. Civil war breaks out in the Roman world. In 40 BC, the Parthians invade Syria, Judea, installing a puppet king in Jerusalem. In 40 BC, again, Roman declares, Rome declares Herod to be the king of Judea. In 37 BC, Herod retakes Jerusalem for Rome after the Parthian invasion. In 31 BC, Octavian Augustus defeats Anthony. Remember Anthony and Cleopatra? Mm -hmm. Okay, the Roman rebellion there at Actium, ending the civil war. Augustus confirms Herod, previously a supporter of Anthony, as king of Judea. Okay, so in 19 BC, Herod starts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So if he starts to rebuild that temple, what would the Jews think? This this is the man, okay? This this is the man. So in, in uh, nine BC, the temple it was consecrated, though the building uh, continues, and it was completed in AD sixty three, well after Herod had been uh, dead. So already we glimpse the same pattern: the victory over the foreign power, the recapture of the holy city. Herod the Great was starting down a famous a familiar track. True, he needed Rome backing, Rome's backing to gain the, and maintain power, but he was good at fancy political footwork, and he got the authorization he wanted, okay? Authorization he wanted. And he was not merely a Roman puppet, but he was the real thing uh, to the Jews, okay? Now, again, Herod the Great had no family tree to back up the claim of priesthood or kingship that was descended from uh, David. And Herod was not even fully Jewish, okay? He was Idumanian, but he married into the royal families, we say, uh, of Judah with his, uh, he had many wives, but Mariana, uh, a princess from the Hasmonean house is who he married, all right? So uh, that's another person. now. Y'all following me here? Am I going too fast? 
Okay. Uh, this is, you know, history. Now, the last person is Simon Bar Gioria, G I O R A, Gioria. Okay. And uh, he's the other, the, you know, he's actually the third failed king, as, as you see this. But he appeared as yet another, in another time of social and political chaos near the start of the great revolt against Rome uh, that lasted from 66 to 70 AD. Now, I don't know if you've, uh, Mr. Stevens gives us a timeline and history of what was going on in Judea and Jerusalem, you know, a hundred and some years prior to uh, 70 AD. But the Jews themselves were revolting against Rome. But the problem was, now we're talking 66 to 70 AD, the Jews were in a civil war themselves. All right. So even though they were fighting against Rome, they were fighting against each other. And you have to keep that in mind. It's, it, it's very important as, as you go through this thing, okay? But we know the Roman rule that lasted from 66 to 70 AD, and that ended with a total cat uh, catastrophe in the, in the temple's destruction. There are plenty of other would-be leaders, prophets, and others at the time, some emerging from families long associated with the anti-Roman activity. But it was Simon who was ruling Jerusalem as the Romans closed in, okay, as they closed in. I don't know how much more to share this with you. Uh, as I, I look at this, uh, it says, instead, as, as the Romans destroyed the temple and the defeat became inevitable, he surrendered. Oh, yeah, this is good. Uh, Simon surrendered to the Romans. And what he did, this, this is kind of cute. In spectacular fashion, he surrendered to the Romans. He dressed himself in white with a purple cloak on top and emerged from hiding all of a sudden on the Temple Mount. Whether he was hoping to frighten people and make his escape or whether he was just putting on a final show of bravado, we cannot tell. He was taken in chains to Titus. Now, Titus was the Roman general that came in to defeat uh, the Jews there in Judea and Jerusalem. Titus, a victorious general, and then shipped off to Rome along with thousands of other captives and boatloads of booty, which you can still see in carved pictures on the Arch of Titus at the Forum in Rome. What happened that as the generals conqu had conquests in different parts of the Roman Empire, uh, you know, when, when Titus came back, he was paraded through the streets of Rome, and what they did is they made an arch for Titus, and they put all sorts of things that he did there in Jerusalem, and part of the booty, just gold and silver, uh, that sort of thing, by the way, which was used to build the Colosseum in Rome that he took from the temple, all right? Uh, that was there, and it's still there today, okay, as, as you see this. So according to the, uh, okay, that was a Roman custom. So Titus was given a, a triumph, a spectacular procession through the streets of Rome, demonstrating to the citizens in the days before television, photography, it could prove by other methods how great a victory he had. That's what the arch was for, okay? Great a victory he won. The prisoners were left behind him, a, be, uh, a bedraggled and sorry crew, and last of all came Simon. He was whipped as he walked along until he arrived at the prison where the death sentence was carried out. Once again, the gale, remember we're talking about this perfect storm, the gale overcame the high pressure system. Titus and all Rome with him celebrated this victory over the king of the Jews. Once again, the Jewish people crushed and dismayed, wondered what happened to the divine hurricane that was supposed to come to their aid. And the problem was Jesus did not come as a divine hurricane, as the other four men uh, tried to do. Okay, so. Preacher? Yes, Excuse go me. ahead. When, when he was saying that he was up in the mount with his white outfit on, yes. with the purple, with the yeah. purple, 
isn't that supposed to be um, like king, the colors of a king? The purple is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they, remember, they put a purple, the soldiers put a purple robe on the Lord Jesus Christ after they uh, right. scourged him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so that, you know, I find this thing, this sort of thing fascinating. Oh, yeah. Because, because what it does, it brings forth a Jewish thought because we're talking, we're not talking Western people here. We're talking Middle East people and their society, how they thought, how they perceived things, you see. That's why when, um, and I don't think we'll go into the lesson, we'll, we'll get to that next week, but we're going to perceive things uh, that we want to take literally. All right? Like the earth shaking and the sun and moon being darkened and turned to blood. That all had meaning to the Jewish people. Okay? And they had already experienced that in their history. Uh, for example, what happened when, uh, and we'll see this next week in detail, but when the Jewish people were called to Mount Sinai, when the law was given, what did God tell Moses to tell the people to do? Does anybody remember? Or not to do, I should say. Mount they Sinai. To come up to the mountain. To okay. come up to the mountain. Don't touch the mountain. Yeah. Don't let your animals touch the mountain because it's going to shake. Okay. And and the darkness, you, you see, if you remember the Ten Commandments, you know, the, the dark clouds over there and Moses was up with uh, with God. All right. The shaking was the voice of God. That it, It's it's an allegory for uh, and not the earth shaking, because as you go through that Old Testament, folks, and you read what the prophets say and what actually happened. OK, if, if those things would actually happen, the earth wouldn't be here today. It had been thrown off its axis, see, and, and that sort of thing. And that's very important for us to understand, especially when we look at prophecy and, and look at this thing, because it, it was, remember, it's God speaking to a people that weren't, uh, how would you say this? They, they had an oral culture. So he used language to get across to them something that wouldn't leave their hearts and minds, all right? Because they didn't have books like you and I have the Bible, all right? They didn't have the books to go back to, to reference. What they had was a visualizing thing that God talked about that, you know, man, if we do this, if we go up to the mountain, we're going to be killed. All right. Now, there's no record of anybody going, you know, touching the mountain or their animals and, and being killed. But the whole thing was on God's part, this is something holy that's taking place. I'm going to right now give to Moses something that's going to direct your lives. And the law was, remember, why was the law given? It was a schoolmaster to bring him to whom? To Christ. Even back then, when they realized they couldn't keep this law, what did they end up doing? Well, they took their sacrifice to the tabernacle and to the temple, which were types and shadows of, of him that was to come. But the point is that God honored those things, see, in, in, their, in their lives, okay? And that, that's very important for us to remember as, as we look at this. So uh, what Mr. Wright has done, and I'll say this to you, this is worth the $19.95, okay? You can get it through CBD. And it's not a, a technical read. It's, it's not a, uh, how would you call it, a doctrinal read. It's, it's, it's like history. Mm -hmm. He brings up the things, the actions of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives meaning to those actions beyond what I've ever seen before, a, a lot of them. And uh, <coughs> I mean, Dan can testify to that. And it, it's, just, it's just a wonderment, you know, that, that you see this. So it, it, it's good stuff. Um, and, it, you know, uh, he has written on the book here, a new vision of who he was, what he did, and why he matters. And I'm going to say something today. Jesus Christ doesn't matter at all on this earth today. Mm -hmm. Except to whom? We Except Christian. the believers. All mm -hmm. right? And here's the shame of it. I, I can't put a percentage on it, 
most believers praise God, I have a redeemer. And that's where it stops. It doesn't go any further. Okay. But what Mr. Wright does towards the end of the book, he says, there's a great responsibility we have. And it's to live in the kingdom right now, where most of Christianity is looking to the future for the kingdom. We talked about that last. Uh, uh, you know, here's Dan to everyone. Amazing book. You can borrow mine. So uh, the chapter I'm reading now, I'm, a, I'm on page 169. I think I only have one chapter to go after this. Um, why did the Messiah have to die? You know, and, and we, we say, you know, for the forgiveness of sins and that sort of, but it goes, it goes further than that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a blessing. Uh, I'm you always, can, yes. You can get this book at, um, uh, Amazon for fifteen ninety nine oh. and dollar sixty off of that. If you use a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Amazon will save you four or $5 yeah. and that's free shipping. Yeah. Right, Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Hebrews, do this. Read uh, Hebrews chapter twelve, start in verse eighteen. Go down about verse twenty-nine or so. Uh, the the actual um, warning is is found in verses uh, twenty-five, uh, twenty-six, twenty-seven. Okay, that that you that you'll find, and we'll we'll talk about that next week, and actually. Uh, close up that study out of Hebrews and and we'll um, summarize the the other other ones and see how they all fit together okay in in, in terms uh, what I found is is this in, in my reading of the book of Hebrews it, it's uh, beside the Gospels uh, it's the most concise book to tell you who Jesus is now, Paul has a lot to say because of the heavenly ministry and, and that sort of thing. But remember, who is Hebrews written to? Believing okay. Hebrews, yep. see? And it's the nation of Israel, the former. There'll never be another, there'll never be a nation again. Just mark it down, okay? Uh, their unbelief of who Jesus was, that really caused a problem. And Paul concisely writes down, this is who he is in relationship to what? New covenant and old covenant. So it, it's really, really a blessing when you see those those warnings. Uh, it was to those Hebrew believers. So they'd hang in there with them. See, they hang in there with them. So uh, it was good. Uh, I didn't know what, what to do here. But at any rate, glad we did it. it it's over with there. <laughs> I introduced, yeah, there, there was I introduced you to the book. Yeah. So uh, I mainly just read because that, that's what it is there as you, as you look at it, okay? But it gives you another view of how the Jews thought and why they thought and what they did, okay? And I think that's one of the reasons they, they didn't accept who Jesus was. Yeah. Because he didn't come forcefully starting a revolt against the government. His revolt was inside, you know, as, as you see that, so... Uh, we, we we praise the Lord for that. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'm going to. Uh, well, well, just just this one thing. Yeah. So these guys were self-appointed. Oh yeah.